This is Dr. Jamie Kaufman, and this is Dr. Kaufman's Acid Reflux Hour. And um, I'm actually going to digress today because I believe I've made a discovery, and I want to tell you a little bit about COVID and long COVID. And uh, so I've been struggling with long COVID uh, since um, uh, 2020, and um, I have had some cardiovascular uh, complications, which are uh, pretty clearly related to, to the COVID and probably to the vagus nerve, I'll have you know. Um, so I'd like to talk about that, and I'll give you the brief outline. I had uh, uh, developed a, 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 what I thought was the flu the last two days of January um, 2020. We didn't know the word COVID yet. I then went to Florida for the month of February, where I coughed up buckets of nasty stuff and was a, a functioning just enough to eat a little bit, drink a little bit, and go to the bathroom. Otherwise, it was a coughing. And after weeks of this, I went and um, uh, uh, got a bunch of antibiotics, and I started to get better. Um, my closure of my um, New York office was um, uh, what I call a guillotine retirement. I never wanted to leave New York. I never wanted to stop practicing medicine, but it is what it is. So after I came here, um, I did fine for a month or so. I bought a dog, and then I was walking the dog, loving the dog. I lived in a closed environment on a golf course. I could walk everywhere, and um, I went to a dog park twice a day. And as time passed over the next few months, I could walk less and less and less, and I got short of breath, and I got fatigued, and my legs wouldn't go. And, um, and I actually uh, had... Um, uh, POTS, uh, which is a, a partial orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and I'll explain that in a minute. And so I, I really uh, uh, languished uh, for the better part of a year, and then I started to make some improvements. Um, so let's leave it at that, and then uh, jump forward um, uh, until uh, March 4th of this year. So I went to Florida. I had a house for my children and grandchildren, a big thing in Florida. And uh, I got there on uh, <clears throat> Saturday night. And um, uh, Sunday morning, it was terrible. We didn't have a car. That we had to, I mean, it was a $500 six, uh, a six hour journey from the airport to the house. Um, so anyway, I, it was a very stressful day. And the next morning I woke up with chest pain and it was chest pain, it was left arm, and it was neck. And after a little while, I said to my sister, I said, this is cardiac chest pain, let's go to the hospital. So we drove to the hospital, and uh, they brought me in. They took some blood immediately, they took an EKG. I didn't have um, the, the, the findings of, uh, I'm going to die in a few minutes, you know, ST changes and all that. So, but meanwhile, um, the, the normal for the... Um, troponin, which is the cardiac enzyme, for the, the, it skyrocketed within the next hour or two. I was in the ICU, cardiac ICU, and my, my, it went to like 41,000, and the, the interventional cardiologist comes in, and I have uh, um, uh, an angiogram. Meanwhile, you should know, once they started an IV and they gave me one nitroglycerin, all my chest pain and everything went away. And he does a cardiac cath, and it's flat normal, completely normal. I mean, it's beautiful. There's not a plaque to be seen, okay? It's just, it's just, it's just clean as a whistle. And, um, and then I had and eventually a, a, a workup, and I had, uh, I had a normal um, uh, stress echo. And that means my, my heart functions well. All the parts do what they're supposed to. I have an injection fraction of 65%, which is normal. So he said that I had um, uh, cardiac uh, 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 a coronary artery spasm. That doesn't make any sense, okay? So let's leave it alone. So I leave the hospital, and I got really, the, oh, I'm two days in the hospital. With my, they have trouble controlling my blood pressure. So I never had a blood pressure problem either. But I'm getting blood pressures of 200, 190. I mean, the highest it's ever been when I get excited, and I do get excited, is 150. You know, I get 150 over 90, but normally it was, you know, the usual 118 um, uh, you know, over 70. You know, it was, but so all of a sudden I've got hypertension. So that was hard to manage. And then they sent me back to the house and I couldn't get around. 
uh, to walk out to the pool, which was maybe 50 yards from the house, I had to stop three times and sit down. So I became completely unable to function as though I was a cardiac cripple. And so um, time has passed, and um, I want to talk about uh, orthostat POTS. So um, POTS is part, well, POTS is, uh, is orthostatic hypertension. So when you, when you stand up, your, your, your blood pressure goes down, and you feel dizzy or faint, um, and you, know, you get your heart goes faster. What happens is there's blood in your legs, <clears throat> and um, you know your your vagus nerve, which controls all of your circulatory and cardiac function, cardiovascular function, doesn't say to <clears throat> get the blood back out of the legs. And we, we, we it was standing up. We need it. the blood is, is not enough blood's getting up here, so the heart goes faster because it's pumping less. And then this tremendous uh, fatigue. <clears throat> I took my trash barrels out. I have. Uh, uh, approximately 70 steps to the top of my driveway. It's a little bit of an incline. <clears throat> um, my heart rate was 57 when I started, and when I got to the top of the hill, which was really a difficult task, was 125, and I had my hands on my knees gasping for breath. So the question now is, is where does this come from? So it's pretty clear that I have a normal heart. It's pretty clear that I have normal cardiac function. What is not clear is that the regulatory system or the electrical system doesn't work. And that regulatory system is the vagus. And if you look at the literature, and I quoted some of the literature, I made a post about this, but I wanted to have this on YouTube. Um, the, that's why you lose your smell. It goes to the brain, it goes to the brain stem, and the brain stem looks like it gets hit. And the brain stem is where the vagal nucleus is, and the vagal nucleus controls the respiratory system, the digestive system, the cardiovascular system, the viscera, your internal organs, it's the most important nerve in the body. So if your vagal nucleus gets cooked, it, it can get cooked any number of ways. I mean, uh, it's interesting that there are a, a, a fair number of these different modifications. In fact, my POTS was so bad um, for a while that um, when I went to eat, uh, I, I start eating, and I guess a little more blood went to my stomach. I have to go lie down for a couple of minutes and go back and eat. And I found that, that you can fight this problem. And so what I'm saying to you is this is all vagal. It's probably vagal nucleus. These cardiac complications. Um, people who have you know, coronary artery disease get chest pain too. Um, but coronary artery spasm, really suddenly high blood pressure, really... Um, and this tremendous um, uh, uh, fatigue and inability to function, to do anything exertional. I mean, taking out the trash can was a major task. So I wanted to tell you that I think this is vagal. So what it means now is we need to open a box and begin looking at the, uh, the vagus and how the vagus nerve functions. I think there's good news. I think the vagus, or at least the vagal nucleus, has the sort of the neural equivalent of a stem cell, and that there's some learning. And, uh, and for example, my POTS isn't as bad. And the reason is, I fought it. And every time I wanted to lie down, I used to lie down, because I felt like if I don't lie down, I'm going to crump. And indeed, I, I started to say, no, I'm going to sit up. I'm not going to lie down to watch TV. I'm going to sit up. And uh, so the more I've sat up and the more active I've been, um, the better is the POTS. But this variation of POTS with the exercise-induced um, fatigue is, uh, is, 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 is a massive problem, and I'm still going to fight it. I want to mention that I did have all the others. Post-exertional malaise means, ooh, I'm an exercise out of this. The next day you can't move um, post-exercise malaise. Brain fog, inability to focus, inability to make good decisions, uh, mistakes. Um, I, I had brain fog. I didn't have any GI symptoms. I didn't have any cough symptoms. Um, but I did have um, uh, shortness of breath and uh, the intense uh, fatigue. Never lost my smell. So just so you should know, 15% of people with COVID develop some long, long COVID symptoms. So boy, I covered that fast. And I would like to make a few other comments. There is some literature that suggests that the really big um, problem post-COVID is going to be cardiovascular. So there is some data and there are some people beginning to study this. I just don't think they know 
that the, the only the only way the mechanism can work is if it's the vagus or the vagal nucleus because you know my, I got a heart looks like a you know twenty five year old athlete um, and yet um, uh, these things are happening it has to be the control system which is vagal so I, I think that um, uh, but the message is that cardiovascular um, complications of long COVID are going to end up being the biggest by far. Um, and the most costly and the most difficult to, to, to treat. So I, I bring this to your attention uh, because if you don't have some of this, which you might, uh, you may know someone who's struggling with it, and then you can recommend they come to this. Uh, this, uh, this is actually going to say, instead of Dr. Kaufman's reflux hour, it's going to say um, cardiovascular complications of long COVID and, then, and also um, uh, Dr. Kaufman's reflux hour, I'll answer questions. So I can't think of anything else to say about it, but I mean, um, uh, you know, I quit playing golf. I quit the pool league. I, I don't go out at night. Um, um, you know, I, I have great limitations. Good thing is my brain is working. I'm working on a book. I'm doing a blog every week, and I'm old, so I shouldn't expect to be, you know, the club champion or anything. So it is what it is. Now, uh, I want to talk about questions. Um, the questions keep getting good. And um, so let me begin by telling you that a lot of these questions, I don't know the answer for sure. So for example, one of the first questions is, is from uh, someone who has uh, 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 ADHD and, uh, and is saying that the medicines, um, Wellbutrin, Adderall, and Vi Vivance, um, uh, uh, cause uh, uh, reflux and uh, well butrin uh, uh, um, is the is the worst um, just to know I'm on well butrin and I'm not having any reflux so the point that I was, was going to make is that when, when when you ask me a question that I don't know about I have two choices I can go do research on the internet and I did and it didn't say reflux but it said you know stomach pain, vomiting, other things, GI-ish. Um, what I rely on is the fact that I've seen so many patients. And I always ask the patient, well, what else do you want? And that includes supplements, by the way. Um, so to, to answer the question, it's Saren's question. Um, in my experience, um, these drugs have not been um, particularly related to re reflux in any of my patients. I mean, I always ask, you know, well, what else do you want? What else do you want? Or do you take any supplements? No. Don't take uh, a B complex. Don't take a chondroitin and glucosamine. They tend to cause reflux. And you should know the blog is bigger than you think. There's, there's a post on, um, uh, on uh, uh, supplements, there's a post on medicines that, that cause reflux. And that's a later question. Um, antibiotics do cause reflux, but not all of them. And so augmentin, which is very often used for sinus disease, does. And uh, um, the, the, the ciprofloxins do, that uh, floxins. Uh, the, the best one, it seems to me, or maybe there's a variation of that, is the z -Pak. So when I look at people are taking, uh, you know, a, one round or possibly two rounds of the z -Pak, um, they don't seem to have a worsening of their reflux. So I don't really know much about it except from experience. But I can tell you for sure that a lot of people, reflux begins when I had da 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 and they put me on antibiotics. And so if you read that article on, um, in that blog is, um, I think it's called uh, um, uh, Drugs and Medicines uh, and, and, and Acid Reflux. But uh, the point is, when you go on the blog, it's not like other blogs where there's, you know, it's what, what's hot this week. You know, the, the article that was written, the three articles on, 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 on proton pump inhibitors, um, they're all completely valid. There's not a single piece of that that's changed enough that that piece that was written two years ago doesn't have, you know, teeth. So um, to answer your question, Sarah, and I, I don't know if there's a relationship between these medicines and um, and reflux or not. Um, I don't have any tips except I would, it's probably not all three of them, like they all cause it. I mean, I would I would talk to whoever's prescribed them about stopping one at a time. And I'd probably try, try the Vivance first only because 
that's the one I don't know anything about. So, all right. <clears throat> so this is a great question Rob asks. Uh, could you possibly explain why my LPR symptoms temporarily disappear when I get full or bl bl blooded? Well, guess what? For people who have heartburn, it's not right after you've eaten. Because what's happened, <clears throat> excuse me, is that um, you've, you've, you've basically buffered or neutralized all the acid with all the food. So that this, this sort of uh, 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 acidification of the stomach comes as uh, stuff starts to move out. And uh, so we see heartburn um, usually, you know, typically um, 30 minutes after eating. And so reflux is reflux um, in the sense that it means backflow. And so I would expect that um, uh, there may still be some, some LPR, but it doesn't have any teeth. Um, and, and that's the only explanation I can come up with. Um, so the answer to your question, Rob, like the last question is, I'm not sure, but we know that people who have reflux symptoms tend to not have them right after eating, but after a while. Um, and the, when you write the LPR symptoms come back with a vengeance later, that's like the heartburn patient, but it's respiratory reflux. And by the way, I want to remind everybody, um, the term laryngopharyngeal reflux I came up with in the 80s because I didn't want to say GERD. My patients didn't have GI disease. Laryngopharyngeal reflux means reflux into the larynx and pharynx, laryngopharyngeal. Turns out it's not a good term. It's hard to pronounce. It's a mouthful. It's, it's a long word. And so, I don't know, I think it around uh, 2017, I started using the word respiratory reflux. So once you have reflux up here, it's in the respiratory system. And so I would recommend that all of you use that term and you know say that this is a, a synonym in a way for LPR, but it's bigger and more accurate. For example, LPR doesn't say anything about the sinuses or the ears um, um, or, or even uh, respiratory symptoms. So respiratory reflux, I believe, is a pinnacle term. We're going to have esophageal reflux, a few people who have heartburn and, and GI disease, and then uh, respiratory reflux. Now, um, uh, to, 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 to digress again, because there's a question here um, about uh, ResTech. There is no technology right, available that will diagnose um, respiratory reflux. So the ResTech probe, in my opinion, is not very good. Um, and the majority of them, are, you might as well flip a coin. And uh, it's just not great technology. And the GI technology, doing a Bravo or, or, or impedance pH, it tells you nothing. Okay, so my experience is that um, I put a pH probe, the highest quality uh, acid measuring device in the throat and the esophagus. That's gone, and the reason it's gone is because the reimbursement for reflux testing is so low that nobody wants to do it. And, uh, or they already have a, 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 a program working and they're an institution that can collect the facility fee. But if there's a doctor in the office, maybe not. So, if pepsin is integrated into tissue, where should it not be? And uh, will it dissipate over time if reflux is under control? And how long does that typically take? Well, nobody's ever done the, the experiment. We did the experiment and people had reflux, they had clinical reflux, and they had positive pH studies. And when they, they were scheduled to have a laryngeal procedure for something, we took a little biopsy of the back of the larynx in a harmless area, and we uh, uh, looked for pepsin in it, and 100% of them had pepsin. By the way, 100% of the patients we tested with laryngeal a carcinoma also had pepsin, and it's called immunohistochemistry. Um, and so um, we know, for example, um, that one area we see in, 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 in mo most people um, with respiratory reflux have silent nighttime respiratory reflux, just the way it is. It's silent, meaning they don't have heartburn. And some of you have both respiratory reflux and esophageal. But um, the, the, the question of um, how long does it take? Would mean we have to go back and take biopsies. So I'll tell you what I know clinically. Um, vocal fold swelling 
is when I do a consultation, I can't examine the patient, but I can hear the voice. And I can hear whether they have vocal fold paresis, post viral vagal neuropathy, and I can hear whether they have swelling. And I ask them, do you know that your voice is heavy um, it's, and your vocal cords are, are, are not right? And, and, and about half are very aware. And they say, yeah, this started at the same time as whatever. Um, but um, the spray, and if you look at my last article um, uh, in the blog on uh, alkaline water, you'll see these little bottles. And here's the deal. Um, when you swallow alkaline water, you don't get any in your larynx. So let's say you're performing eight shows on Broadway. There's nothing you can do better than this. The 9.5 alkaline water that my Sierra water pitcher made, I put in these little bottles um, and I can, my valve area, my throat, my vocal cords, pepsin dies. Protein, uh, it breaks. Okay, and it's denatured at pH 8, let's say. I'm spraying with 9.5. So the spray is really good um, for the voice and for the throat, lower throat. <clears throat> to answer your question, is I don't know how long it takes to wash it all up. <clears throat> I do know, um, however, that when the swelling goes down and the vocal cords look normal again, I would expect there to be no pepsin. So to answer that question was, if someone has, and let's just say a score of 16, a reflux finding score, is an F, okay? Um, I've never seen one come back to normal in less than three months. But symptoms, we have rapid responders. People can get much, much better in three weeks, except for post-nasal drip. So the respiratory system, um, mucous membranes line it, and when irritated, they make more mucus. It's very easy to differentiate allergy uh, from reflux. Allergy is thin uh, mucus, and it never bothers the vocal cords. Uh, reflux is thick, and it, <clears throat> it's a problem when it gets down there. So um, re respiratory reflux uh, all the way, and um, I don't know how long it takes to go away. Clinically, three weeks, people can get a big improvement. And I think three months, you can see normalization of vocal cords from very fat to thin. It's a great question. It's an interesting question. And I wish I knew the answer. Today, it's all ones that I, I have feelings and thoughts about, but I'm not sure. This is a good one. Jane wants to know, I, I was told I have lingual tonsil hypertrophy and a cyst, which I, I biopsy on. Can this been due to silent reflux? Yeah, don't let, don't let them touch you, okay? If anybody um, wants to, I, I had a woman who had a lingual thyroid and her, she had neurogenic problems and they, they locked it off and they, they did four operations on her before she came to see me, four wrong operations. So if you have a lingual tonsil, um, you need to pay attention. You need to be sleeping um, on, a, on a big incline, not eating too late and probably taking uh, 40 milligrams of formodidine or pepsin. Uh, Pepsi uh, uh, before dinner. Um, once on your diet for the first two weeks, do you recommend the preference for the way you taper a PPI? You don't taper a PPI. You stop it. And you switch over to, um, if you I'll read all my stuff, it's, it's formodidine, a one in the morning, one before the last meal, two before uh, uh, a bed, uh, 40 milligrams, so it's 20, 20, 40, and you just switch them. Now, 30% of people are going to have rebounds. So this thing is tapering them, like you take one every other day or you break them and pour them out. So, you know, most people don't have rebound hyperacidity and heartburn. If you do, get Tums and Rolaids and, and take your Gaviscon after, after every meal and, and chew gum a lot and, and, and spend more time up. Certainly don't go lie down and watch the news after dinner and all those things. So most people... Uh, don't actually taper proton pump inhibitors, they stop them um, because there's no real tapering um, protocol. Sally asks, regarding vagal neuropathy, can symptoms such as painful voice and burning throat eventually get better without medication? And um, the answer is yes. Um, but let me just talk about that. I wrote an article recently a voice use pain, painful speaking, I made up a term, odynophonia. Odyno is painful, phony is speaking. 
So, so that's, that's neurogenic symptom. Reflux will make it worse. So a lot of people have neurogenic symptoms. If the reflux goes away, the neurogenic symptom will settle down. Um, the, the answer is um, it will go away on its own. Um, for people who are teachers and, 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 and coaches um, or actors, um, and they can't get through the day because of voice use pain, then they, they need treatment. Now, I recommend a tiny dose of, of, of amitriptyline and then the gabapentin that's graduated from pediatric doses to adult doses and then escalated as needed. If you have a problem with gabapentin, then you ought to try pregabalin, which is Lyric, it's more expensive, but they're not the same and I have people who can't tolerate one will do the other. And uh, amitriptyline hardly ever is a problem. The dose is so small, um, it's just it's, it's there because it makes the, the GABAs work better at lower dose. So, um, yeah, um, struggling with side effects of medication is always a problem, and I don't know what to say. Um, I think this is funny. Um, Jana wants to know, my ENT said I have no more symptoms of LPR. How does he know that he has symptoms or not? No more findings of LPR? Um, hmm. and, can, can, and so um, uh, two months after following your book and blog, but I still have thick mucus in my throat, which drives me crazy. So, is it a with the vagus? Okay, it's not a vagal problem, mucus. Mucus is the slowest to go away. Those little, those, those little mucus glands are like wartime factories in overdrive. These mucus is supposed to be a protective barrier layer. So, Postnasal drip is the slowest symptom to go away, or you still have reflux, and you know your doctor doesn't really have a handle on identifying it so very accurately. But um, mucus is tends to be the slowest. And the other thing I say is, I am when I used to have that, I don't. I really hydrate, and my little syrup pitcher gets filled twice a day and it's sitting in the sink getting filled as we speak. And um, I just recommend being hydrated. I, I found that I, I feel better, I have more energy, and a lot of other things. Um, and so it'll make your mucus less thick and easier to move if you're well hydrated. Well hydrated. So yeah, <clears throat> eventually it'll go away if your reflux is under control. <clears throat> so here comes the, the follow-up question from Mary. Besides LPR, what could extremely thick mucus be a sign of? Well, uh, nothing. I mean, you can have you know pus and stuff if you've really got an active sinus infection. Um, there are other things, um, but pretty much, um, I've been you know practicing medicine for the better part of fifty years, and uh, so thick mucus is, a, is the number one. Uh, reflux symptom, post nasal drip, chronic throat clearing. So, um, I, I can't think of anything that would be common enough. I suppose Sjogren's syndrome, <clears throat> if you're not making enough saliva and you can have thicker stuff, but I don't know. <clears throat> How do you get rid of metal taste? Boy, these questions today are really something. They're difficult. And I wanted to get to, to Peggy's questions, and the answer is I don't know. Um, it may have to do with um, zinc deficiency. Um, it's a big workup for these kind of taste problems. <clears throat> so Peggy wants to know, in dropping acid says detox phase, only the detox list and detox recipes in books. And you know what? That's not true. So I wrote a second book, um, Dr. Carpenter's Acid Reflux Diet, which is really a companion book. And there are a lot of recipes, a lot of them are, 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 are vegan um, and gluten-free. And um, so it's, the ideas are good enough. So, you know, you're going to make a chicken dish. Are you going to use lemon? No. Can you use basil? Yeah, you can use it, but can you use rosemary? So the spices, except for the peppers, you can do all kinds of stuff. So I don't, there is some discussion about the, about the spices, but pretty much all of the regular, ordinary, and spice might be the wrong word. You know the tarragons and the savory and all those—they're all fine. Um, and 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 it, <clears throat> and um, it is it is uh, okay to uh, substitute agave. Um, I think you can make up your own recipes. Um, I had um, 
uh, one where I used, uh, I made pasta with, with mushrooms and olive oil and, and basil and just put it on gluten-free pasta and I gave up on it because I didn't like gluten-free pasta. Now I'm using um, uh, glass noodles and they're fantastic and you can get them in the special Asian aisle. The glass noodles are made of buckwheat and they, t they taste delicious, they're a little chewy and um, they're great, glass noodles. <clears throat> Most recent blog mentions neutralizing acidic fruits and oatmeal. Um, th this concept of pH balancing. So you, we know you can put a banana in your oatmeal. You know you can put raisins in your oatmeal, a little bit acidic. But there's all this non-acidic stuff around. But no, oatmeal has got a high pH, not acidic. <clears throat> so the same thing's true with anything else. Is that if you have enough alkaline <clears throat> substance. Um, in something you're eating, and there's some acidic component, this acidic component doesn't have the same impact as, as, as if, if you ate them separately. And so pH balancing is a, is, a, is a difficult concept, but it's the real deal. Well, listen, everybody, I'm very sorry. Um, I, I've run over a couple of minutes, and I think next time the questions are good and they go on and on and on. And by the way, carob is fine. Um, that let's do a, a Q and A next time, and I, and I'd like to focus on long term management. So the big question will be, and if if you want a topic, it will be, what do you do after um, detox, um, which is bigger than an induction diet. So anyway, thank you all very much uh, for joining today, and for those of you on the internet, remember the long COVID thing. You know, send it to your friends, let them know. Um, that that's going to be up on, as you know, these go up on the YouTube. And I think Brenda will probably have it up uh, this evening or at least tomorrow morning. Thank you very much.